Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time zone you're in. Welcome to tonight's National Museum of Computing lecture, which is tonight being given to us by Elonka Dunin and Klaus Schmey on the subject of breaking historical ciphers with modern algorithms. Uh, as I've already said, for those who just joined at the last minute, um, this call is being recorded, so if you want to uh, turn off your cameras, you are welcome to do so. <clears throat> and with that, I will say, Ilonka and Klaus, you are good to go. All right, thank you. So we are thrilled, thrilled to be back uh, speaking here at Timbuk. Um, it was, it's always quite an honor to be here. And uh, as uh, he said, this is our topic for today. And I am Ilanka Dunin. I am a, a game developer and a cryptographer. And my co-author is? Hello, I'm Klaus Schmee. I'm a German IT security consultant, crypto expert, book author, and blogger. And the, the, the URL of my blog is cypherbrain.net. And together we wrote this book, Code Breaking, A Practical Guide. It took us three years. Uh, but we're, we're quite pleased with it. And some of our reviewers are actually here on this call. So, um, and uh, reviews have been quite good. So uh, thank you to everyone. So we're gonna start here by talking about historical ciphers with the question of, can these old cipher texts be broken with modern methods? Uh, of course, there are the methods that were used at those times uh, to crack these things, but we're also specifically going to be talking about modern uh, computer methods. So these are just some examples of different systems. Uh, this, for example, is one that was uh, created by Emperor Ferdinand III in the 17th century. Uh, this is on the other side of the pond, uh, one from North America, the Winthrop cryptogram, also from the 17th century. We'll be coming back to this one in a moment. This is one a little bit older, very famous, the Voynich manuscript from the 15th century. We'll be coming back to this one as well. Uh, the oldest encryption that we know about, that Klaus and I know about, is this one from Babylonian. So we believe it's Babylonian. goes back to about 1300 BC. You can see it's a tiny uh, eight centimeter or about three, in, you know, three inch uh, little clay tablet. And it was an encrypted form of a recipe for a pottery glaze. And of course, then as now, people were wanting to keep their industrial trade secrets secret. So now modern systems. Yes, uh, well, modern cryptanalysis is an interesting topic. I'm sure some of the people in the audience are familiar with this um, science. You probably know that it's a uh, very, very interesting task to uh, cryptanalyze, uh, to try to cryptanalyze a modern encryption algorithms such as uh, AES or DES or Diffie-Hellman. And you probably know that there are plenty of publications uh, in this field. There are virtually thousands of papers that have been published on modern cryptanalysis. But the problem is with the classical ciphers Ilonka has introduced uh, on, on the previous slides, these uh, modern uh, Cryptanalysis techniques don't help. We need completely different methods. And this is because there are major differences between modern cryptanalysis and historical code breaking. For example, in modern cryptanalysis, the algorithm is always known. In historical code breaking, this is often not the case. In modern cryptanalysis, the goal is to determine the key. If we are dealing with an old cipher text, the goal is to determine the plain text. In modern cryptanalysis, the ciphers we examined, uh, examine are usually quite sophisticated. This is not always the case if we look at uh, an old encrypted message. In modern cryptanalysis, the plain text is usually known or can even be chosen. This is, of course, not always the case uh, when we are dealing with an old cipher text. If we examine a modern system, we usually have an almost infinite amount of cipher text available we can examine. In historical code breaking, the cipher text may be quite limited. Uh, it happens that we have only something like 10 letters in a message. And in modern cryptanalysis, 
the ciphertext, of course, can be easily read. But uh, if we have one of these old cryptograms from a past century, it might happen that it's very difficult to read the handwriting and that we are dealing with transcription errors. So the bottom line is that modern cryptanalysis and historical code breaking are two very different things. So let's look at one of the most uh, common and simple systems called monoalphabetic substitution. It comes in basically two forms where we have uh, an alphabet change and no alphabet change. So the alphabet change is where each letter is changed to some symbol or number and no alphabet change is where each letter is switched to another letter of, of the same alphabet usually. Now, from a code breaker's point of view, there's really no big difference between the two. And, and I'll show why in a moment. Uh, this is an example of something that has an alphabet change. This is a Freemason document. Uh, this has, so you can see that instead of uh, recognizable letters, they have these symbols. Now this code system or cipher system is generally called the Freemason cipher. They did not invent it, but they used it pretty much more often than anyone else did. So it's commonly called the Freemason cipher today. It might also be called the pigpen cipher because of the way that it, it, it's formed. The Freemasons also used other cipher systems. So this is a monoalphabetic system that has, does not have an alphabet change. You can see it just goes to other similar letters. So how do we solve a monoalphabetic substitution? Well, we count. It's frequency analysis. So if you take any large English text, Moby Dick, for example, and you count all the letters in it, certain letters will come out as more frequent and then others. The letter E will most likely come out as the most common letter there. It'll come out in English, around 12 to 13% of the letters will be E's. The next most common letter will be T's and then A's and O's and, and so forth. And so if you're looking at a, an encryption system, that's one way to figure out what kind of letters those are. It, it's, it's a guess. You, kind of but that's a lot of code breaking is you start with a guess or a hypothesis and then you kind of tease things out from there so we're going to come back here to the winthrop cryptogram this was made by john winthrop in the 17th century he was an american scientist he was also the governor of the connecticut colony and he had this interesting thing it looks like it was dabbling in alchemy a bit so um we can see along the top it, it's actually english it's dissolution of something and something else. Now those two symbols are commonly used in alchemy. The uh, one with the triangle and the plus below it is commonly used for sulfur. The one on the right is a little trickier to figure out because there isn't a symbol that looks exactly like that. Uh, now sometimes alchemists would make up their own symbols or, or possibly we just lost the top of this symbol and it's actually meant to be a circle with, with uh, the uh, two other intersecting lines inside of it. If that's the case, it would mean vitriol or, or some type of uh, acidic solution. Now, the rest of it is encrypted. And we make it, we're going to start with our guess here of is this a monoalphabetic substitution with an alphabet change? And again, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to count. And we find out that that symbol that looks sort of like an eight, there are 27 of those. And then the next one is 17 and then 16. So, you know, 17 and 16. It doesn't say for sure what letter that is, but with a little uh, trial and error, we came out and we found out that, yes, indeed, the most common one was an E and then an I, it might also be a J, a T, O, S, and N, and so forth. So it came out to say dissolution of sulfur in perhaps vitriol or something else. Take excellently well purified bay salt, dissolve or melt it down in some convenient vessel over the fire, then throw some sulfur of any metal leisurely upon it. And so by degrees, it will melt in it and become fusible. So again, that, that symbol that may mean vitriol, there's no vitriol mentioned here, but maybe molten salt. We don't know for sure, but in, in any case, we have solved the code system here. Now, if you're trying to do frequency analysis, there are many different types of code breaking software that you can use. These, they do much more than just frequency analysis. They do many, many other things typically. And there's no one thing that we want to recommend because there are tons, tons of them. So if you're looking for some, uh, a, a particular 
type of uh, software, our recommendation is just to experiment. Look for something that uh, you like. You like the interface. It's fairly straightforward for you to use. It, it gives you this kind of warm, fuzzy feeling as you're playing with it, and then keep using it. Or not. It's, it's entirely up to you. Uh, one that Klaus likes to use, this one is called Crypt Tool. It's an open source package, has many, many different people involved with it. Uh, Bernard Esslinger is the, the head of the project. Nils Kopal is the senior developer. And then dozens and dozens of other people have been involved with it as well. So we're going to go on to another monoalphabetic substitution sample. This one is by Sabine Berengold from 1896. He wrote a book, a pamphlet called Curiosities of Olden Times. And in this pamphlet, he created a, a, a cryptogram called the Berengold cryptogram. Now, this is not a curiosity of olden times. This is something that he created for the book, but this is it. And so, again, this is something, if it's a monoalphabetic substitution system, we're going to make a guess that it is, um, that that's what it is. And then it's an alphabet change system. So the first thing to do is to make it into a non-alphabet change system. So the way we do that is we start with the top left character and we say that's an A and then we just keep going. The next one's a B and a C and a D and any until we find the next symbol that repeats. So in this case, it's a four. And so we make the four what it was in the first place, which is a C and then any other place that a four appears, we make that one a C as well. And we go forward until we get the next one that's a repeated symbol that every plus is an H. And, and then we can just go on and, and continue with the entire thing. So we end up with a non-alphabet chain system that has the same frequency properties, but it's really too short for us to do any meaningful frequency analysis in it. So what do we do? Well, here's where computers can come into the, into the story. Yes, uh, we are going to use a method that is called hill climbing. Uh, hill climbing is a technique that has been around in computer science for several decades. Mm, it's a method that can be used for different uh, tasks, not necessarily related to uh, cryptanalysis. It can be used for many different kinds of optimization problems. But it turned out that hill climbing is also uh, very well suited for um, classical code breaking. It's not suited for modern cryptanalysis, but for the breaking of uh, old cipher systems, it turned out to be very efficient. So how does it work? Well, uh, first of all, in the first step, we generate a random key. And as we are dealing with a substitution cipher here, or at least we assume that uh, this means that we generate a random substitution table. It's the one you see on the right. Then we use this table to decrypt the cipher text. We get a plain text candidate. And now we rate the correctness of the plain text candidate. I will explain later how this works. Uh, for the moment, uh, it's enough to know that um, it is possible to rate the correctness of the plain text candidate. And uh, let's assume that the correctness is or has a measure of 108. So in the next step, we create a new key, uh, a new um, substitution table, which is only slightly different from the old one. So perhaps we can switch two letters, but it must be similar to the old one. And in the next step, we rate the correctness again. Uh, no, sorry, we decrypt the ciphertext again, and then we rate the correctness again. And then we check if the correctness has increased. And in this case, this is the case, the correctness has increased from 108 points to 100, 150 points. And if this is the case, we are going to keep the new key. But in the case that this doesn't happen, if the correctness uh, decreases, we restore the old key. And uh, this is how uh, the, the most part of the Algorithm works. We always create a new key, check if it leads to a better result. If it doesn't, we, we are going back to the old one. And this technique is called hill climbing because the, our, random, our random key, the one we use at the beginning, is considered as the starting point in something we can imagine as 
uh, mountain range. And from there, we always check uh, the closest uh, points so that are, are only one step away. And if we reach a higher uh, position, we are going to stay there. If not, uh, we are going back. And uh, in the uh, diagram, you see here only the successful steps are counted. And this means that we uh, climb the hill, we get higher and higher. And if we are lucky, we end up with a position that is a solution. And we can check this um, by uh, trying if there's a, a better position that can be used from there. And if this isn't possible, or if, if several tries to get a higher altitude are not successful, we assume that we have reached the maximum, the peak of the mountain range. And if we are lucky, this is the correct solution, which means we have the correct plain text. So on the next slide, we will see that there is a problem that might occur, the so-called local maximum problem, because it's possible that we reach a point in the mountain range uh, where no higher altitude can be reached anymore by moving just one step. But in this case, uh, this uh, peak is not the highest peak in the mountain range. It's only a so-called local maximum. And in this case, it's a false solution. This is something that can always happen when hill climbing is used. We might end up uh, in a position that looks like a correct solution, but isn't. And uh, there's one uh, quite uh, common way to solve this problem. Uh, we use a related technique, the so-called simulated annealing. A simulated annealing is a generalization of hill climbing, and it's basically the same. The only difference is that downhill steps are also allowed in exceptional cases. So if you look at our path now, you see that once in a while, the path goes downhill. As I said, this may only happen in exceptional cases, otherwise we would never reach the summit. But uh, these exceptional cases make it possible that we reach a local maximum, but that we don't stick there. Mm, it's possible to move down from there again and then reach another peak. And in this particular case, mm, we reach the second, uh, the, the correct solution so more or less in the second try or the second peak we reach is the correct one. And now you might ask where this name simulated annealing comes from. Well, it comes from uh, chemistry or material science. Annealing in material science means heating and cooling a certain material to alter its physical properties. And mm, when the material is heated, it, this increases atom diffusion. And when it is cooled, this leads to recrystallization. And the purpose of this process is to reduce the hardness and to increase the ductility of a material. Uh, ductility, the ductility of a material is uh, the uh, possibility to uh, change the form of this material without breaking it. And uh, this is where the name comes from. And well, in the real annealing in material science, uh, different temperatures are used. And this is also used in simulated annealing. Of course, uh, the temperature here isn't really a, a physical temperature, but it's just a, a variable that can be uh, changed. And a low temperature means that uh, only small downhill jumps are possible. And what happens if uh, low temperature is used can be seen here. If the temperature is low, it may happen that we reach this local maximum. And as only small downhill jumps are possible, we get stuck there. So a low temperature does, uh, uh, leads to a wrong solution in this case. A high temperature means that uh, Larger downhill steps are allowed, as you can see here. And this means um, if the temperature is high, it may happen that we reach a local maximum, but we, that we don't stuck there, uh, stick there. And that from there, we get to another maximum. 
And here, uh, these uh, rate marked uh, parts of the path show that mm, big downhill jumps are allowed here because these are big downhill jumps. And the most common approach is to use both uh, high temperature and uh, low temperature. We start with a high temperature and uh, perhaps we reach a local maximum and we get away from it again. But as uh, the process proceeds, we cool down, we lower the temperature. And this means that uh, in this case, uh, it works perfectly well. We first reach local maximum, but we get away from it again. And then when we get closer to the real solution, the, uh, the, there's not the danger anymore that uh, we uh, get to another uh, peak, which might be the wrong one. So this is how simulated annealing is often used in practice. And now the next question is, how we can rate the correctness of a plain text candidate. Uh, this is done with the so-called scoring function. And of course, uh, there are different possibilities, but the most common approach is to um, use a scoring function that is based on letter frequencies. We can see uh, one example here. Let's uh, assume that we have a plain text candidate that uh, is something like he, new, or uh, lit. And of course, this plain text candidates contains many frequent letters or letters that are frequent in the English language. It contains only few rare letters. So this one gets a high rating. And the second example is something that contains an X, a Q and other rare letters. And on the other hand, the frequent letters of the English language are rare in this particular string. And this is why this candidate gets a low score. And this is how the correctness of a plain text candidate can be uh, rated. Of course, uh, there are mu much more um, sophisticated scoring functions and uh, programming a good scoring function is a complicated task, but the uh, letter frequencies usually play an important role. And now let's look at an example. We look at the Bering Gold cryptogram again, and we show a program that was uh, a hill climbing attack that was programmed by Bart Wenmakers, a New Zealand based uh, crypto expert. Um, as you see here, in each step, uh, the substitution table is shown at the top uh, of this uh, record. The scoring function result is on the top right. Then the plain text candidate is in the lower line. And we start with step 100. So we skip the first 99 steps. And we only look at successful steps, uh, only at steps where the scoring function increases. And this is step 101. The scoring function result has increased. The plain text candidate looks a little different now. Mm, but only little has changed because this is also not always the case in hill climbing. And then we make the next step, 102 and 103. The scoring function results get higher and higher. And if you look at step 107, mm, meanwhile, the plain text candidate reads, a merd in the hand is worth two in the mush. This uh, sounds almost like proper English language, but um, well, at, at least there, there seems to be one problem. Merd and mush uh, don't really look like real words. And in fact, step 108 finally finds a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. This has the highest scoring function results we can get. And apparently, this is the correct solution. Here we have it again. The plain text of the Bearing gold cryptogram reads a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And in my view, it's really fascinating to watch the computer program break such a cipher without your uh, human interaction. And this works quite well. So as we will see, or as we have seen now, and as we also will see later, hill climbing is a very powerful technique for code breaking. And many other Monoalphabetic substitution ciphers have been solved in the same way.
So now we're going to go on to another type of encryption system. This is the turning grill encryption. Uh, just as a very brief example of it, you can see along the top here, we have a message to be or not to be. And we take each letter and we put it into the holes of this grill. Then we turn the grill 90 degrees and then continue placing letters and so forth. So we're filling in a, a matrix there, a four by four matrix in a very particular way uh, to make sure that everything gets filled out. We'll use fillers. In this case, we use X's. It might be something else. And then when we're done with it, we read it off by rows. So the top row of this ETTO becomes the first four letters of the ciphertext and so forth. So the ciphertext would then be transmitted to the receiver who would have a grill of the same uh, shape and size with the same holes, and then they could decrypt it in the same way. This is a very old system. It goes back, I believe, to the 1400s. These are just a few examples uh, from different countries. So we have a Dutch letter, an English journal, an Italian one. Now, the trick here is, is that breaking these messages gets tricky because it's different from other types of systems. So, for example, in, in monoalphabetic, polyalphabetic, the more ciphertext you have, it generally means the easier that a system is to break. Whereas with turning grill, it's the opposite. The larger the message is, or the larger the grill, the more difficult it becomes to break because the systems are difficult. I'll, I'll keep my language clean, but they, they are difficult. A lot of guesswork is involved and it's very slow and very tedious. However, computers do not care about slow and tedious. Yes, and um, well, my guess a couple of years ago was that the turning grill encryptions can be broken with hill climbing uh, because many old ciphers can be broken with hill climbing. But I didn't know any publications about this topic. So what I did, I introduced a turning grill challenge. I created it uh, with a a large turning grill and I published it on my Cypherbrain blog and then I waited uh, if my readers were able of solving this challenge and uh, in fact it lasted only a few hours then Armin Kraus, a very good German code breaker, came up with a correct solution and it even turned out that I had, mis had made a mistake in the challenge but in spite of this mistake, uh, which led to a wrong order of the letters, in spite of this mistake, Armin Gross was uh, able to solve this uh, challenge and he used hill climbing. This is what I had expected. Well, the way hill climbing is used here is very similar to the case I uh, showed previously. Uh, we need to generate a random key, but of course a random key is not a substitution cipher here, but it's a random grill. Um, a random turning grill. And then we decrypt the ciphertext, we rate the correctness of the plain text candidate, and um, if the correctness increases, we keep the new key. If it doesn't, we go back to the old key. So this is exactly the same uh, procedure we are using here. And when the correctness doesn't increase anymore, we assume, or at least we hope, that we have found the correct plain text. However, there's one other difference uh, that uh, we need to be aware of here. When we use a uh, turning grill and we uh, try to program a scoring function, we can't use letter frequencies. Why? Because the turning grill cipher is a transposition cipher and transposition ciphers don't change letter frequencies at all. So uh, counting letters doesn't help here. We need something else, but what works a lot better is we use the frequency of letter pairs or even letter triples or letter uh, quadruples or, or something like that or let, other letter groups. Um, in English, as you might know, the letter pairs TH or EN or ER are quite frequent, so these lead to a high score if they appear often in a plain text candidate. On the other hand, if there's a plain text candidate with many rare letter pairs, such as Q, R, C, X, or P, F, this results in a low score. And this is exactly how Armin Krauss programmed his turning grill hill climbing attack. 
Here's the challenge. On the right side, you see the solution. Well, it's uh, just um, a text about the mood landing. This is not relevant. All that is relevant is uh, that uh, I used a quite big turning drill. And anyway, Armin Kraus had no big difficulty to break this uh, challenge. So we can conclude even messages created with a large turning drill can be broken with hill climbing. And this again proves that hill climbing is a very powerful uh, algorithm for breaking certain ciphers. So next we're going to go over a system called nomenclators. This is also a, a very old system. It's generally a, a, seen as a combination of things. It's a monoalphabetic substitution, but that also includes complete words, often proper names. And this is that the, the term nomenclator is named after a, a certain job that someone would have when they, when visiting dignitaries would enter a room and this person would call out uh, their names and their titles. And that person was called the nomenclator. And so that's what uh, this cipher system is called. It it's, goes back in Europe at least until the 14th century. So this is an example. This is not an actual nomenclator uh, table. This is just an example of one. But you can see that it uses both letters on the left and words on the right. So if we were going to encrypt this plain text phrase, will come from London to Berlin. So the word will, we would do it straight as a uh, monoalphabetic system, each letter one at a time, uh, come, same, from. Now here, from is not going to be encrypted by one letter at a time because from is part of our nomenclator table. So in this case, we're just gonna use the number 43. London is also in our table, so that's just 30. Two, we would have to spell out, and then Berlin, again, would be a single number. So this is how a, a nomenclator is typically put together. So here's an example of a real nomenclator table. This was used in uh, North America. This was used by George Washington, part of his Culper's spy ring around 1780. So you can see that there are letters that are transitioned to letters, perhaps not the best nomenclator table, but uh, this is uh, often good enough at the time. And then um, also we would have numbers that would stand in for various words. Um, this is another nomenclator table. This is from the 16th century. And uh, here's another one from the 17th century. So this is more typical where you can see each letter, it's a homophonic kind of system. Each letter could be uh, one of three different numbers and then you can get letter pairs. So each consonant followed by one of the different vowels could be one of two different numbers, a two digit or a three digit number. And then of course you have the words. So in this case, the three different words, each one could be a potential three digit number. So here's an actual example of a, a nomenclator cipher text this is from the 18th century. So you can see it starts out, sir, I received your letter. And this is what's called clear text. And then it goes on to the actual encrypted part. And this is the, the uh, cipher text and it was a nomenclator system. And then it goes back into the clear text and has a clear text signature. Those of you that are fans of the Broadway musical Hamilton may enjoy this where it says, I am, sir, with great regard, your most obedient, humble servant, Manchester. There's a, a song that goes on, your, your obedient, humble servant. So um, here's another uh, cipher text from the 17th century. Um, perhaps not the greatest security here because whoever decrypted it took each number and then wrote above it the correct letter that should go there. Now, what they should have done is after that destroyed the message, but they kept it for whatever reason. And so we, in today in the modern day, or perhaps anyone else that might have captured it at the time, then has a way of potentially reconstructing the nomenclator table, knowing which numbers are, are going to which letters or to which words. There are thousands of these that are in the archives. Uh, when Klaus and I have met different uh, archivists in Europe and they kind of shrug their shoulders and roll their eyes going, we have so many of these in our archives that have not yet been decrypted. So this is a very active field of research right now. Klaus and I even found a few earlier this year uh, that had not yet been decrypted and, and Klaus publishes them on his blog. And then um, the race is on, the race is on of how can it be decrypted? So how do you solve a nomenclator message? Well, the easiest method is 
you find the table. Um, and this is, uh, sometimes we already have the table is known. Sometimes we might be able to uh, derive the table from other messages. Um, and uh, you know, there, are, there are other methods as well. We, we may have bits and pieces of different things. So this is another uh, French nomenclator message. This came to us from Karsten Hansky. This one is in French. So you can see it goes back and forth from the clear text to the orange parts, which are numbers. Now, in this case, the table was found. This was uh, found by Jean-Francois Bouchaudy in a French archive, very large table. And we can see, uh, for example, here we have the number 1383, which I believe it is saying Lacage, might be Lacage, I'm not sure, but let's say Lacage. And so then when you're decrypting the entire thing, you go from clear text to ciphertext to clear text and ciphertext. So in this case, the ciphertext, the numbers come out to the phrases, demander quelques jours de repos après lesquels. <clears throat> and then when you put it all together, you get the entire message. Monsieur le Duc de Dramatique lui avait demandé quelques jours de repos après lesquels sa majesté se proposait, and onwards, you're going back and forth from the clear text to the, the French uh, plain text. So how do you break a message if you don't have the table? Well, if the table was well constructed, this can be fairly difficult, but often this is not the case and it's not a well constructed table. So um, this, is a, this is another example. This is a message that was sent in 1573 from the Vatican to a papal diplomat in Poland. So someone who is uh, experienced with these kinds of systems is going to look at these numbers and identify that most of them are two digit numbers. And, and there are a few three digit numbers mixed in there as well. So they're going to make a good guess that the two digit numbers are letters and that the three digit numbers stand for various words. And so from there, if you think they're letters, you can go on to that monoalphabetic substitution and count and running the frequencies of the two digit numbers and experimenting with some different languages, we found out that it was in Italian where the most common letter is an E followed by an I, O, an N and so forth. So in this, in this case of this nomenclator message, frequency analysis worked. And uh, Italian is not one of my languages, but I'll make a guess. Giudicando, che con nessuna cosa e su cosa and onward. Now the number 608 we still don't know because we don't have the table. So we don't know what is the proper name or other word that would fit in that particular location. And we won't know until either we find other examples of this type of uh, nomenclator uh, table system or for, perhaps someone will find the table because new things are showing up all the time in the research. So this is a very active field of research and uh, anyone who wants to get involved in digging into the archives, perhaps making uh, some sort of database of the tables and other messages, please come on in and help. And the next topic is probably known to most of you. It's uh, the Enigma. The Enigma was a German encryption machine in the Second World War. Not the only one, but the, by far the most important one. And on the next slide, we see two German soldiers using an Enigma. Um, as far as I know, about 30,000 Enigmas were produced during the Second World War. And this is how the Enigma worked. Of course, it's a little simplified. On the left side, you see a keyboard from A to F. Uh, it has only six uh, keys. Usually, it would be 26. And then you see three rotors, uh, three ordinary rotors and a fourth one, which is called a reflector. And how the Enigma works, can we see, uh, uh, we can see if we look at the A key on the upper left side. So I've now pressed the A key and now a current runs through these rotors. It hits the reflector, goes back, and then it lights up the C bulb. And in this case, the letter A is encrypted to the letter C. And of course, these rotors are not static. Mm. Uh, on the contrary, after each letter entered, 
wrote a one turns by one unit and after 26 letters uh, wrote a two also turns by one unit and after row the two has turned 26 times row the three turns by one unit uh, this is like an uh, odometer counter on the next page we see that uh, the enigma was broken so it looked uh, very secure for uh, for the expert of the time but in fact already in the 1930s there were polish mathematicians who broke the enigma. Uh, if you look um, at the map in, in the center, you see this red spot. Uh, this is Germany. It's highlighted because uh, these Polish mathematicians broke German enigma messages already in the 1930s, and they were the first to be successful in the field, in this field. In, uh, also in the 1930s, there was a British mathematician named Dilwyn or Dilly Knox, who uh, broke, uh, also broke Enigma messages. Um, he broke messages that were sent in the Spanish Civil War. And the red spot you see now um, marks Spain. Uh, during the Spanish Civil War, the Enigma was used and uh, the British broke at least some messages. And of course, the most successful Enigma code breakers were the British at Bletchley Park during the Second World War. There was a large team. Uh, the most prominent member was, of course, Alan Turing. And they broke Enigma messages from pre pretty much everywhere where the Germans used it. So basically in Europe and in the Northern Atlantic and then there was uh, Elizabeth Friedman, one of the best code breakers in history. She also broke Enigma messages during the Second World War. The messages uh, she broke came from South America. Uh, th these messages were also sent by uh, Germans, but uh, 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 they came from South America. And finally, there were also successful Enigma code breakers in the US. In Dayton, Ohio, there was a team led by Joseph Desch. They mainly broke the U-boat Enigma used in the Northern Atlantic. They used uh, the methods uh, they had learned from the British, but their machine, which was a special version of the, Turing, of the machine Turing constructed, was even faster and more efficient than the original one. So on the next slide, we see well, this is uh, Bletchley Park, the place where Alan Turing and his team broke the Enigma during the Second World War. And of course, uh, we are, Ilonka and I are very glad to give this particular talk today um, for an institution located at Bletchley Park. What you see here is the machine the British used for breaking the Enigma, the so-called Turing bomb. Over 200 copies of this machine were built and uh, it proved quite successful, but it only uh, worked when a part of the plain text, the so-called trip, was known. And uh, getting trips for this reason was very important for the British during the Second World War. But our talk today is not about uh, the co-breaking of the Enigma during the Second World War. Our topic is breaking it or breaking old encryption systems with modern means. And this is a very interesting field of research because thousands of World War II Enigma messages still exist. And usually the plain text is not known. And for this reason, several research teams have uh, started to break old Enigma messages and they have been very successful. The seminal paper in this field was published by Jim Gilogli, a friend of Ilonka and mine, in 1995, he published a paper in Cryptologia titled Ciphertext Only Cryptanalysis of the Enigma. And uh, the method he introduced, uh, which was based on hill climbing, was later improved by other experts, including Frode Weyerud, Geoff Sullivan, Olaf Ostwald, George Lasry. And they uh, were quite successful. Meanwhile, most of the Enigma messages that are still known or still exist from World War II have been broken. 
And on the next slide, we see um, how this worked. Well, of course, we can only give a basic introduction on the method uh, they used. We need to look at the Enigma keyspace first. Usually, there were more rotors than could be used in a machine, uh, for example, eight rotors for a three rotor machine. And this meant that the rotor choice and the, the selection of the, the order was a part of the key. And second, of course, uh, the starting positions of the rotors were a part of the key. And third, it was also possible to change the ring position. So to change the location of the letters while the position of the wiring wasn't changed. This was one part of the key space. And then many Enigma models also had a so-called blackboard, which uh, implemented a simple letter substitution. And this added uh, to the key, or this made the key a lot larger. Altogether, there were about 276 keys. And it is clear that even today, it's not possible to break uh, a key of uh, or a key space of this size with uh, exhaustive search. So other methods need to be applied. And it turned out that it's possible to uh, start a hill climbing attack on the first three parts of the key space. We need a scoring function that works independently from the plug board. Letter frequencies can be used here. So this is something that works quite well. And once we have found the first three parts of the key space or of the key, we need to take care of the fourth one. And this can be done with hill climbing or with the traditional frequency analysis. Uh, so the plug board realizes only um, simple substitution cipher and this can be broken. So all in all, we have a method that works quite well when it comes to breaking Enigma messages. And as I said, the project teams uh, that have been working uh, in this field proved quite successful. But anyway, there are still a few unsolved Enigma messages from the Second World War. Usually they are either short or they might contain an error or they might have been encrypted with an Enigma model that's known. So otherwise, uh, if it is known which kind of Enigma was used and if the encryption is correct, it's, it's usually possible to break the message, but in some cases this didn't work. And so the research is ongoing. So next we're going to cover something. It really wasn't a, a widely used system, but it was such a major breakthrough that occurred over the last year that um, we just feel it would be wrong to not include it. And this is the encrypted messages of the Zodiac Killer. And this was a serial killer who was active in the area around San Francisco in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And he would send a taunting messages to newspapers. And some of them were in uh, plain text and some were encrypted. And he would claim that if we could solve the encrypted parts, it would give us uh, his identity. So we uh, have named the code breaking community. We have named these messages with a Z for Zodiac and then a number indicating the number of characters that are in the message, the number of encrypted characters. So the first one that he sent was called, we call the Z408, and it was actually solved quite quickly in 1969 by a husband and wife couple, Donald and Betty Harden in Salinas, California. And um, Donald had long been interested in Cyprus. He was a, a teacher of history and economics. And uh, Betty, his wife, uh, also gained an interest in it. Uh, and, Together, they spent 20 hours working at the kitchen table, figured it out. Betty was the one that made the guess that the first letter, uh, since the killer was probably very egotistical, that the first letter may have been an I, and that turned out to be the case. It was a homophonic system, and saying, I like uh, killing people because it is so much fun. I mean, this guy was, was clearly mentally ill. Um, and, um, and then the, another message that he sent around that time, he called the Z340. Now this one remained unsolved for decades, uh, generations. And it achieved something of a legendary status. There were people who were 
claiming to have solved it uh, several times a year. You know, people were saying, oh, it says this, it says that, it says this guy's my uncle, and all these different things. And then finally, one of them panned out, and, and it was a real solution. And it, it's actually, a, it was a little bit amusing to Klaus and me because our book came out in uh, December 10th of last year. And on December 11th, uh, and we had a section in it on the Zodiac Killer Ciphers. And uh, December 11th, one of our colleagues, Dave Aramchek, contacted me and he said, you're going to have to rewrite the book because we've solved Z340. And of course, we had to kind of check it. And, and it turned out to be true. Uh, it, it was tested by the FBI, uh, tested by, by many independent code breakers around the world. And it was just a, a remarkable success that we like to call the greatest success in the history of non-military proof analysis, especially considering that it was this a teamwork via the internet, via computers, three people, three men in different continents. So Dave Ramshack was in Virginia, the United States, Sam Blake was in Australia, Jonathan Ike was in Belgium. Uh, they didn't know each other. Their only common interest was in solving Zodiac and an interest in uh, uh, computers and encryption and brainstorming together, they figured it out. So uh, there are some wonderful YouTube videos that they've created that really go into it in detail. Uh, we're just going to cover it very briefly here. So the first 20 letters, again, if you start with the top left-hand character and then you come down diagonally, sort of like chess moves, like a knight moving down one and over two, down one and over two, and then continue on with the diagonal. So we're just going to do go through the first 20 characters. And then having done that, again, it was a uh, homophonic system and that came out, the plain text came out to be, I hope you are having, I hope you are having lots of fun and trying to catch me. And then he went on to, to discuss other things about seeing someone else who had claimed to be him on a television show. And he was saying, no, that wasn't me. And um, some other, and I'm not even gonna bother reading it. I never worked on the Zodiac myself because I didn't want to crawl into the, the mind of, of someone who was this ill, uh, but many other people <laughs> took it on as the challenge, So and they did solve it. So I completely celebrate the, the three of them. So that leaves two other messages by, um, that remain uh, un, in, undecrypted. We call them the Z32 and the Z13. Now, some people say that these will never be solved because they're too short. Others say, well, maybe they will be because we'll find some tie-in with the other two messages, some homophonic uh, system or, or something else that we know is directly related to the Zodiac. For example, now on Z13 on the right, we do have the clear text where it says, this is the Zodiac speaking. By the way, have you cracked the last cipher I sent you? My name is, and then uh, some uh, cipher text letters. And there's some people who say, perhaps tongue in cheek, that these 13 letters spell out the name Alfred E. Newman, who, as some of you know, is the uh, character from Mad Magazine. So there are other unsolved ciphertexts. Yes. Uh, as an example, there's the Voynich Manuscript, uh, probably the most uh, famous unsolved ciphertext in the world. It's a book written probably in the 15th century. It contains... Um, well, it has 230 pages, it contains plenty of text, and all this text is written in this very strange, unknown script. And so far, it's completely unknown what uh, this uh, text means. The script is unknown, it has never been deciphered. So, as I said, it's one of the huge mysteries in cryptology history. Of course, uh, many Analysis of the Voynich manuscript text have been made. Here you can see the uh, frequency analysis and the letter frequencies uh, look quite normal for an ordinary language. So it, it doesn't look like a pure random. So we can state fact one, the text in the Voynich manuscript has some properties of natural language. But then there's also fact two, which says that it can't be natural language, at least uh, that's what many linguists say, because 
the structure of or, or the grammar of uh, this text that is in the Vinish manuscript simply doesn't fit with a natural language. So in, uh, in the end, I'm, meanwhile, I'm pretty sure that uh, the Rhinish manuscript is not uh, something written in an ordinary language with, with an unusual script. Uh, there must be more behind it. And um, so in the end, the Rhinish manuscript is not only an unsolved crypto mystery, but also one of the great unsolved mysteries of mankind, in my view. Okay, um, so another one, this one's very uh, close to my heart. I spent many years working on it. This is a sculpture at the center of CIA headquarters called Cryptos. It was created in 1989. Uh, if you want more information on it, my website is ilanka.com slash cryptos. I've seen it myself twice. It was very difficult uh, getting an invitation to CIA. I'm not going to go into great detail on it uh, other than to say there are um, four <clears throat> copper plates on it. On the right hand side, we have a divisionaire tableau. And on the left side, we have a, say a, what we call K1, K2, K3, and K4. The first three have been solved. Uh, Jim Gologly, who we mentioned earlier, uh, solved them with uh, hill climbing. And then there were also others that solved it with paper and, pe paper and pencil methods. And then there's part four, still unsolved, one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. The artist, Jim Sanborn, has even given some hints about that last section. For example, in 2010, he told us that the word Berlin was at a certain location. Uh, then he gave us a, four years later that the word clock existed. Then in January 2020, the word Northeast, and then the pandemic started. So he said, okay, I'm gonna give another clue to kind of mix things up. I think he was bored from quarantine. And so he gave us another word, which was the word East. So here we have a substantial uh, portion of the plain text. We still don't know what the rest of it says. Um, many people are working on it. Lots of computer programs have been written and anyone that wants to give it a try, please, by all means, uh, have at it. Uh, it would be lovely to have this one off my plate. So uh, that's Cryptos. And again, you can go to my website if you want more. Uh, next, we're gonna go to a couple other unsolved messages. This one, these are by Ignatius Palaki, and he was one of the first private detectives and may well have been the inspiration for uh, Sherlock Holmes, the fictional detective Sherlock Holmes. And he would publish newspaper ads communicating with his clients. And some of them were in plain text and some of them were encrypted. So these are just two of them. We can see series of numbers. We have, they're clearly some type of encoded or encrypted message, but we've never been able to solve one of his messages. Um, you know, perhaps there's latitude and longitude coordinates there. Uh, we don't know. So again, maybe it'll be computers that will finally figure this out. Another unsolved uh, postcard. This is one from 1873. This is by George Furlong, and it came to us from his great, great grandson, Andrew Furlong. Andrew would love to know what it says. Uh, but this one is, um, we have the challenges, as Klaus described earlier, of transcribing. Uh, we don't even know exactly what the letter system is. We don't know where one letter ends and the next letter begins. This is not a system we have seen anywhere else. Uh, maybe it was just something private between George and his sister. He was sending this to his sister. Maybe there's more elaborate system here. We don't know. So anyone that loves these kinds of unsolved challenges, here's a, a good one for you. And there are many more ciphertexts that remain unsolved. Uh, these are just a, a few. On the left, we have a couple of the better known ones. At the top left, we have the DeBosness message. This was a, a wife murderer in New York in 1800s. He wrote several messages while he was waiting in prison. At the bottom left, we have by Edward Elgar, we have the Dorabella cryptogram from 1897. Uh, and then on the right, we have two lesser known messages. At the top right is another message from World War II. At the bottom right is something from the Cold War. And these pop up every so often. There'll be a construction site and someone will come up with a, a bottle with a message in it that looks like it was a dead drop message that never got picked up. 
and it's there and it's encrypted and we would love to know what it says. So research is ongoing on all these. So as a conclusion, uh, this is still a very active field of research. It's, it's a very different type of cryptanalysis from analyzing modern systems. You really have to use a different way of thinking about these things. The hottest technique is hill climbing. Uh, maybe others will uh, come up in the future as well. Uh, and there's still plenty of these things to solve. So thank you. And thank you, Elonka and Klaus, for an excellent presentation. And thank you for putting in that extra chapter about uh, simulated annealing, just for me. I saw, I saw you were enraptured while we were talking about that part. <laughs> So we have some questions for the speakers from uh, Eyal Grus, who first of all asked about the pig pen cipher and then answered his own question by finding, by finding the, uh, the file in question on the German uh, Freemasonry website. And yes, now it's, he's, uh, it's from the internet. Yes, <laughs> isn't everything. <laughs> Not everything in our talk is from the internet, but this one is uh, an encrypted message uh, that is uh, uh, introduced on, on a website. Uh, of course, I don't know uh, the URL by heart, but I can check. And um, he then goes on to ask two other questions. <laughs> I'm wondering if the second question is related to the challenge, which is currently on your blog about prefix three uh, variable length substitution ciphers. Uh, okay. Yes, well, this uh, question is about the trigrams. No, below that. Below that. Well, uh, the, the trigram question is also interesting, but I can come back to it later. Two questions for the speakers. Do you know of any available software that demonstrates solving? Well, I don't know of a software, but I know uh, the videos uh, Ilonka mentioned. So Dave Oranchek published several videos where this is explained quite well. Yeah, and, you know, as I recall from one of the videos, he said that yes, one of the packages had been modified to show the uh, the end-to-end -end, uh, method for it. Um, it might have been Cryptool, but um, yeah, if you look for uh, uh, Dave Aranchek's video channel, I'm trying to remember the name of, it's called Let's Solve Zodiac. Dave Aranchek, that's his thing, Lit Solve Zodiac. Uh, I would, yeah, he started it like by episode five, they'd solve Zodiac. <laughs> so, so now he's trying to figure out what else he can do. And, um, and then the other one, Nils Kopo also has a very good series of videos on solving things. So I think it's one of those two, they talk about a package that will do it. Two, are there available tools to solve prefix free variable length substitution ciphers? Well, uh, this is something I can uh, at least say something about. Now, if you're interested in this topic, I recommend uh, to look at the blog post I published earlier this week. It's not the latest one, but the second to latest one. It's about a cryptogram that was created by a blog reader of mine and uh, it is um, uh, this uh, cryptogram is uh, created with a Huffman like uh, code. And as far as I understand it, with a prefix uh, free, um, prefix free system. And meanwhile, there are about uh, 40 or 50 comments on this uh, challenge. So, um, so far, I think no, none of the comments mentions uh, a special tool that can be used for this purpose. But a lot, uh, but my readers have uh, written a lot of comments about uh, analyzing uh, cryptograms of this kind. And perhaps uh, s some of these readers can answer this question. Uh, I can't at the moment. And then just... there was uh, the question about uh, trigram frequencies. Yes. Uh, this is uh, very interesting because one thing I learned over the last few years is that uh, uh, scoring function gets more powerful the longer the letter groups are that are examined. So the best or, or the, the most powerful 
Mm, functions or uh, scoring functions I have seen so far were created by uh, Jarl van Eike, uh, the one, uh, the, the code breaker that was mentioned by Ilonka and by Louis Helm. And I, if I'm not wrong, they used a ladder or eight ladder groups uh, for frequency analysis. And this was especially difficult because you need a very large corpus of text uh, to even create uh, statistics uh, that are meaningful uh, when you examine eight ladder groups. And I think uh, Jarl van Eike, he uh, used something like uh, all texts from Wikipedia and all books that are available on Project Gutenberg and all, uh, just about everything he could get. So he used a, a huge corpus of text to uh, create the statistics he used for uh, his uh, scoring function. And in the end, he was su successful in breaking uh, a challenge I published on my blog so I still don't know why longer letter groups are uh, more efficient when it comes to uh, scoring function, but for one reason or the other, this seems to be the case. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me, are there any uh, further questions? Are people unmuted? They can unmute, yes or they can use the chat as they, uh, as they wish. We love questions on any topic, or maybe someone has discovered a code that we don't know about. We love hearing about codes that someone has dug up or found or uncovered in an attic. Are you, are you aware of a monument to the Polish code breakers outside the Pols Poznanski Zamek? It's like a Toblerone, if you're familiar with that, on end. It has the names of... Has you the mean names. the one in Poznan? Yes, outside the, the castle in Poznan. Contains, uh, the, doesn't it contain the birth dates or something like that of the... Of Maria Nurievsky, Jerzy Rozicki yes. and Henrik Sigalski. But those, it's covered in numbers. There are yes. hundreds of numbers. We've identified the birth dates and the the dates of the deaths of these three gentlemen. I'm just wondering if you've considered looking at all the other numbers. Yes, I wrote a blog post about uh, this uh, challenge a couple of years ago. Uh, and of course, I asked um, Marek Rajek about, uh, yes, uh, he was probably uh, even the one who created uh, this uh, sequence of numbers. Uh, he didn't confirm that this is really an encrypted message. So it, it might be just um, uh, random uh, consists of random numbers. Or do, do, do you know anything else? Do you know if this is really an encrypted message? Well, I did ask him, and he didn't deny it either. Oh, okay. <laughs> he doesn't deny it, but he also doesn't uh, admit it. it. Yes. So, so we don't know. At least my re readers didn't find anything that looked like an encrypted message, uh, let alone the solution. So a, a question from Vidya uh, about where to buy your book, and I bet it's on Amazon. Yes, it's on Amazon. Yeah. And Colin, um, one technique I use for optimization of the content is ballistic hill climbing, but he hasn't been able to make that work for hill climbing with crypto. Klaus? Um, sorry, I, I don't know what ballistic code, uh, what ballistic hill climbing is. Uh, can somebody explain this to me? You can, yes, yes please uh, unmute. Yes, you should be able to unmute. And turn camera on. I love seeing people. Sure about that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, very good talk. Thank you. Um, I've been using um, hill climbing to solve cryptograms for a very, very long time. And one of the things I use, I mean, hill climbing is one of my just go-to methods for solving all sorts of stuff. Um, one of which is uh, optimization in, in very, very high dimensional spaces for other things. And the idea of ballistic hill climbing, if you go to your um, analog of actually hill climbing, call it hill descending. So we're trying to go into a valley. And one of the, one of the things is that you can end up in a, in a lower uh, or in a, in a less low valley, the equivalent of getting a local uh, optimum. So one of the things which is very similar to simulated annealing 
is imagine having a ball that has momentum. So as it's rolling across the, um, the landscape, so it gets, uh, its path gets deflected by the gradient. And so it can go deep, be warped down in and it loses energy because of friction. But even though it goes into a local minimum, it can then climb out because it still has enough energy and it rolls around the landscape and gradually loses that energy over time. And then it's more likely to end up in a deeper, um, a deeper optimum than, um, than if you just use ordinary uh, hill descending, hill climbing equivalent thing, but upside down. So it's like simulated annealing. You're, you're allowed to go in the wrong direction, but now it's in the wrong direction if you have enough momentum and it's in the wrong direction uh, because you have momentum. Now, the problem with the uh, permutations that you have on the keys when you're doing substitution ciphers is there's no concept of continuing in the same direction because uh, every time you swap a pair of letters, uh, if you try swapping a pair of letters again, you're back where you started. So your, your space is an extremely high dimensional torus in effect. And every time you step in one direction and step again, you're back where you started. Uh, so I was wondering if this concept of momentum for the particle that's moving through your space, that's trying to end up in a, in a local or indeed pre preferably global optimum has been adapted to this kind of problem. I wouldn't know. Uh, I, I have never heard of ballistic code, um, sorry, ballistic hill climbing, but it sounds interesting. But in the publications I know, this has never been mentioned. Um, of course, uh, there are people uh, who understand a lot more about uh, code breaking with hill climbing than the two of us. Uh, we can forward this question to somebody like. Uh, uh, George Lassery, who is a specialist in, code, uh, in hill climbing, or somebody else. Perhaps I can ask this on my blog. My sure. Address. I mean, one, one of the problems that you get is the curse of dimensionality. Um, and optimization in very high dimensions is hard because spheres aren't round, your landscape isn't smooth, spheres are effectively spiky, um, mm -hmm. and the entire search space tends to look like a, a mesa with flagpoles and and, and deep wells sinkholes so you like tend to gravity wander. wells is what i'm thinking about yeah yeah so but but what it tends to happen in high dimensionalization and this is one of the things that i've, I've worked on a bit using using other techniques which somebody has mentioned in the chat as well um so there there are other high dimensional techniques uh, but the problem that you end up with with the the analogy of hill climbing is basically everything is nice and smooth and level and there's not very much that improves and then suddenly you drop down this sinkhole and that's one of your solutions, but then it's nowhere near one of the other sinkholes, which is of a different depth. And, and so there's just nothing you can do with those sorts of things. It tends to be difficult in a discrete space, such as the, the permutations that you get for substitution ciphers. I'm not gonna turn down anything. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask uh, something? Well, you, you mentioned that you used uh, hill climbing for breaking, uh, Cryptograms, uh, can you tell us something about this? Or, or what I, was, kind of... I was just doing exactly what you were doing there. So uh, with uh, substitution ciphers and Playfair ciphers and Visionaire ciphers, um, I was just, just doing basically exactly what you were doing. And this, I, I put in the comment about log trigrams. I find that uh, for, for medium-sized messages, um, log trigram frequencies is just a nice balance between how long it takes to converge and how hard it is to compute. Uh, it was interesting that you talked about using much longer um, letter groupings, sort of seven or eight letter groupings. Um, but uh, I, might, I might have to go and try some of the things. But I'm just doing this for a bit of fun. Uh, people occasionally send me cryptograms, and sometimes I send cryptograms to other people. Um, and in particular, I do a lot of math, uh, science communication talks. And one of the talks that I do is on coding theory, Morse code, uh, and, and simple uh, cryptograms. And then actually I move, I see Whitfield Diffie is here. So one of the things I talk about is Diffie Hellman, uh, Merkel Williamson key exchange techniques uh, in arbitrary groups, um, not just in Z mod P, but also in, well, elliptic curves is the obvious one now. But um, um, so, so I, I use, and of course, hill climbing doesn't work there. But I, I just used um, hill climbing as, as one of the things I do in maths masterclasses for, for breaking these kinds of cryptograms. So do you have a website? Um, I have a website, but very little of this is talked about uh, in, in the website. Um, I will, uh, not to everyone. Um, well, you know, if you I'll just, um, 
your, your, your email address would be much appreciated. So. Yeah, that sounds so, very interesting what you do. Uh, if, you, if you look for my name on the internet, um, it's a fairly common name, but if you also then add maths and juggling. So if you just do a net search uh, for, it, for Colin Wright. Uh, okay, maths, I think I've uh -huh. heard of this before. Uh, you, you're doing this uh, maths juggling stuff? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, really great to meet you. I, I've heard about you. I didn't remember the name, but I came across... Uh, this topic, and I read about uh, the juggling of maths, uh, who was probably graded by yourself. So, right. yeah, some, some friends of mine and I devised a notation for juggling, and it's turned out to be fairly popular. Okay, okay. well, this is very interesting. I, I came across it, and um, I did some uh, juggling uh, too, but I used it uh, for a presentation about uh, steganography. So, I did some. Uh, stick on graphic uh, chuckling, which was uh, received cool. quite well. So, cool. uh, so very interesting. So I will. You, I you should you should you should look me up and send me a link. Um, yes. Okay. I will certainly do that. So the the easiest website. Um, I'll just type it in here. Um, the website is almost deliberately a jungle, so you really do have <laughs> to find your own path through the website. Um, it's it's basically a brain dump in a static wiki like thing, and, and it's it's. I was going to say it's poorly arranged. It's not. It's not arranged. Yeah. So, yeah. it's it's rich. It's it's rich in interlinking. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's the website if you want to. And and my email address is is all over the website. So you can okay, it. great. Thanks. And I'd be delighted I, I, to open a conversation. Yeah. Okay, I'll go back to being mute again. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, we are coming to the end ah. of our slot, unfortunately. And I, there are no further questions that I can see in the chat. So I will take 30 seconds to advertise our next talk, if I may, which is, uh, which is on November 10th, on Wednesday, at the same time as this meeting. And it's a talk by one of our um, volunteer guides, Dr. Ted Coles, about Tunny and Colossus, um, which as you may well, everybody probably knows, we have a, a rebuild of the Tunny machine and of Colossus in our, uh, in our museum. We'd love you to be able to come and visit it, but if you can't, then we'd love you to come on this talk instead. And with that, I think I'll bid everybody a good night or have a good lunch or whatever time of the day it is where you are. All right. Thank you again. Uh, thank you for joining us and giving us a, such a splendid talk. And with that, good night, everybody, and good day, and good evening, and good morning. Good night. Ciao. Just yes. auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Bis zum nächsten Mal.